Hello everyone, it's Teacher Paula here today and I do not have a Monday motivation. I have Monday information for you guys. I've been waiting a couple of weeks to make this video and I think I've kind of gathered my thoughts well enough to present a video today. I'm going to give information about my life as a black American woman and how racism has affected me as a mother, as an educator, and a leader in education where I live. So I don't want this video to be too long. I've got some notes that I'll be reading and I just want to hit some pointers today. I want to start with first, um, as a mother, how does racism in America affect me as a mother? And I, I mean, with everything that's going on in the black community and the, the ridiculous number of lives that have been lost over the years um, is, is just horrific. It's horrible. And as a mother, it's really terrifying. So I look at videos and I look at Facebook and pictures and I look at parents that are so excited about their children, especially their Teenagers, oh, they, they've, got, they've got their learner's license and they're learning to drive and they're so excited. They're so excited. And my son is 27 now and I remember when he was 15 and his friends started getting their learner's license and they were so excited and they started to drive and some of them were 16 and they were getting their license and driving and I just remember being terrified for my son. I, I remember thinking, oh my God, what if something happens to my baby? And like I said, he's 27. So, you know, that's been some time, but I was scared. I, I wasn't like, oh, wee, he's, he's getting his license. I was terrified that him and his black friends would be harassed or pulled over and my son wouldn't come back home to me. I, I honestly was fearful of that. Um, it terrified me. It did. And I just believe in prayer and I believe in not letting that negative thought, you know, take over. But I didn't tell him this, but I was so scared for him. And I remember telling him and my daughters, please, no matter what the police say or do, I want you to just listen and do exactly what they say. Uh, I don't care if they're wrong. I don't care if you didn't do anything wrong. I don't care if you weren't speeding and they say you were. Do exactly as they tell you to do. Now, that was 10 years ago, you know, 10, 12 years ago. And um, people think this is a new thing. Oh, this is new and I can't understand why people are angry. No, this is not a new thing. This has been going on for centuries, this type of hate. It's just that we have social media and we have representation that we didn't have years ago. So as a mother, it's terrifying for me. My son is an intelligent, strong-willed black man and he knows his rights. He's very smart. And I was always fearful that he would speak up and and a police officer wouldn't like that or he would question what they were doing. Why are you pulling me over? And they would get upset with him because as a black man, you don't have that right in America to question a police officer. You don't have the right to say, why are you pulling me over? Because then you're confrontational and you're seen as argumentative when you're just asking a question about your rights as a human being, as a person. So um, I, I feared for my daughters, you know, I feared that something would happen to them and they were, I think, a little more cautious and a, a little more fearful about what could possibly happen to them. But I, I was really scared and I still fear, you know, today for my son because you just don't know how people feel and people look at me and they think, oh, Paula, you know, I love Paula, I love her family, but... You connect me and my son and my husband together. But when my son is out in the world alone, you see him as a black man, as a threat. You see my husband in the parking lot somewhere of Walmart and he, he's walking up to your car. You don't think, oh, look at this nice black man. You're thinking, look at this man walking up to my car. Oh my gosh. 
You know, those are the things that the silent, silent racist thoughts that we have that people don't talk about. People don't mention those things and, and you don't say it, but you feel it. You see a group of um, black boys walking up and you're like clenching your purse. And I, I even have, you know, some some white people when I go to different places that will lock their doors when I walk past their cars and I'm just going to get to my car. And it's because, you know, that that mindset that there is a reason to fear black people and um We've passed that on in, in small conversations that we have and, and things that you say to your children and things that you allow other people to say around you and your children that has created this idea of we should be feared, that automatically a black person is a threat because of our skin color. A lot of people look at me and they think, oh, Paula's so sweet. She's so nice. She's so kind. And that's because you know me. And we've built this relationship together. But to see me on the street, people that don't know me, I've seen them walk in the other direction. I, I've seen them, you know, grab their child's hand and, and pull them away because they don't want me to walk near them. And it's it's ridiculous. It's But it's real. It's real. So as a parent, I've been, you know, just worried and fearful for my child's life. And as a, as a wife, I worry about my, my husband. He gets up, he goes to work early, early in the morning. And I worry about his safety. What, what if his car breaks down? And what if a police officer pulls him over and it's dark on this dark back road, um, going through Villa Rica headed to Cobb County? I don't know what would happen. I, I don't know if something could end tragically for my husband and that's a horrible thought to have and to fear you know think of you know on an almost daily basis is it's terrible but that's the reality that I live in as a, as a black wife as a black mother and people think this is new this is not new this racism has been around and this hate for black people has been around for a long time I'm 46 years old I remember Growing up in Chicago, my grandmother would take us to the grocery store. My grandmother was old school. I mean, she got dressed up. She put on perfume. She put on her Sunday best to go to the grocery store. And it was a big deal. And we would be so excited. But I remember if she went a certain way to the grocery store, and instead of going the long way, going all the way down to, she lived on 44th, so instead of going all the way down to 47th, she would cut through on 43rd and cut under the Vidoc and pass a certain white area. And uh, it was known that blacks could not come in that area. And they would throw rocks at my grandmother's car and bricks and call us niggers and tell us to get out of their area. And even in high school, I remember my mother and I were walking and there was a certain part of, of 35th and not State Street, but beyond State Street by the, I can't think of it, but there was like, not, it was like a Georgia dome, but not a dome, but it was where the circus used to be. I can't think of the name of it, but it was this area and that we knew as black people, it wasn't a safe area for us to walk in. And that was me as a teenager. And I remember walking with my mother one day and I was so nervous and I was so scared that something bad was going to happen. And I was so happy when we finally got out of that area because it was known to not be safe for black people. So um, that was me as a teenager. You know, that was over a long time ago. Let's just say that. So that, that racism still lives. It's, it hasn't gone away. People think you're still talking about slavery and you're still talking about segregation when that happened so long ago. No, it, it continues and it still lives on today. And as a black woman, as a black man, we still live it. We still have to deal with it every single day. We deal with this type of behavior. We deal with the looks. We deal with the comments that people make, the racist comments that you don't think they're racist, but they are. I moved to Georgia as a senior in high school and I went to Pebble Brook High School at the time and it's totally changed. But when I went, it was 
basically a majority white school. And there were Confederate flags on the backs of trucks and um, not Georgia flags, Confederate flags on the backs of trucks. And they wore their Confederate shirts. And I came from Chicago and went to an all black elementary school, went to an all black high school. So I was scared. I was nervous. I was scared. And I didn't know how to respond to that. And I thought, oh my gosh, are they going to have a riot? Are they going to, you know, start a, 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 um, a, a racist riot here? Why do they have those flags? And um, a friend of mine told me, it's just what they do. It's just what they do here. And they just have the Confederate flag. But I didn't feel like it was welcoming. I didn't feel like, yay, I'm in the South and everything is wonderful and dandy. I felt like we weren't welcome. I felt like they were letting us know that this was their South and this was the way it was going to be. And I didn't feel comfortable at all, especially coming from an environment where I was proud to be a black woman. I, I was raised by black teachers and educators that instilled in me what my ancestors had contributed to this country that the slaves had really built and helped build this country and make it what it is today. So to come and feel unwanted, I had never experienced that before. It was something new for me, but it was a learning experience. And I remember that you had to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance in high school. And this was new. I, I mean, we sung the... Um, Black National uh, um, Anthem, the song, Lift Every Voice and Sing at our, um, <laughs> at our assemblies. And we were raised to believe in ourselves, that we were intelligent, that we were hardworking, that we were smart, that we deserved to be treated equally. So that's what I grew up believing. And I knew that the Pledge of Allegiance did not represent me as a black woman. It didn't represent blacks, period, because at the time that it was written, it was not about black people. The Constitution was not about black people. And so to stand for something that did not represent me at the time, I didn't I didn't understand that. And I was like, I'm not standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. And I remember <laughs> My homeroom teacher was so angry and she was so mad at me because I wouldn't stand. So as an educator, don't miss out on an opportunity to educate and to teach not only yourself, but to teach those that don't know. So she was going to give me detention. She was livid. She was pissed at me. And I think back, uh, you know, I still think she was wrong. I still think that this was an opportunity for her to educate me and to talk to me about the lives that were lost and the sacrifices that were made over the years for um, our freedom here in America. But one of the history teachers talked to me about it because I was seriously ready to take that detention because I believe that you have to stand up for what's right. And... Um, the pledge doesn't necessarily, when it was written, it was not written for all people, even though it says that. We all know that if you study history, it was not written for black people. So that, that's another video. But I had a history teacher that told me, he says, okay, I, 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 you know, you have this issue with the Pledge of Allegiance and the Constitution and things that are not fair. And you're right. He says, but how about you stand up? for change. How about you stand up because you're going to do something to make America a better place. You're going to do something to make those words true. And I thought, wow, man, that was so powerful. And at 17 years old, this teacher who they said was crazy because he had been in the war, he was a veteran, and he would have these episodes and they called him the crazy teacher. And I thought the crazy teacher taught me so much from that one year that I spent in a majority white school that I felt like it was life changing for me. <laughs> he really did. He, he really changed my whole thought process on the Pledge of Allegiance and honoring America as my country. 
So I say that because right now I know who I am. I am a black woman and I am proud to be a black woman in America because my ancestors helped build this country and make it what it is today. If there had not been the slaves, America would not be what it is today. The sacrifices, the sweat, the blood, the tears that were shed for over 300 years of slavery, you can't tell me I'm not a black American woman. No, I don't know what tribe my ancestors came from in Africa. And no, I, I don't know what language they spoke, but I know for a fact that the slaves helped build this country. And I'm a part of that ancestry. And so I'm proud to be here because people died for me to have the opportunities that I've had. Black people died and suffered for years so that I can live in the home that I live in. I can teach in the schools that I teach at. I can say that I am an American. They died for those rights. I vote because of those people, those black people that died for me. So a lot of people say, well, you don't know your, your history. You don't know what tribe. I don't need to know what tribe I came from. I don't need to know the language. It would be nice, but I know that I'm an American woman, a black American woman. And my ancestors helped build this great country. And it is my country also. So that's what I raised my children to believe. And that's how I feel. Do we have some changes that have to be made absolutely and it's time to make them it's time to stop acting like racism doesn't exist especially as a teacher as an educator it's time to stop it i live in a county that it's mixed you know there are some areas that are majority black and there are some areas that are majority white and i've watched over the years i've been in this county for 20 years this year and I started out as a parent. I started to volunteer as a parent. I went back and got two college degrees while living in this county. And I taught in this county for nine years, I want to say. I was an administrator in this county for two years. So if you know me, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When I started teaching in 2006, I want to say I was the only black certified teacher in that school in 2006. And so now that um, over the years, there were maybe three or four certified black teachers. I'm not talking about assistants. I'm talking about certified black teachers. And in 2020, I want to say there might be two or three certified black teachers in that same school that I taught at. And people think, oh, what um you know that we have black teachers if you have two or three black teachers in your school in an area that is 70 percent you know black in this area um that's not enough like like <laughs> That's, that's not uh, equality and that's not showing blacks and whites that black people are educated, that we are intelligent, that we are educators, we're leaders, and that we are active in the school system. You know, it's just... It's just, it's just a sad situation as an educator to be, to be surrounded by that. And to me, that's like systematic racism where if I have one black teacher... Then, then we diversified our school. If I have one black person in the building, one black educator, one black certified teacher, one black administrator, then we've diversified the school. I need to place the black people here in this area and let's make it diversified. But where I live, they tend to put black teachers and black administrators only in certain areas. So what you're saying is black teachers, black certified teachers are okay to teach where black children are. If there is a high percentage of black teachers or low income families, 
then it's okay to put the black teachers there. It's okay to have a black administrator in this area. But if there is a low population of black or Hispanic students, we really don't need black teachers there. We, we don't need black administrators in those schools. There are schools in this county where I live that don't have any black teachers. They don't have and have never had any black administrators. So what we're saying is black teachers can teach black students and low income students, but black teachers cannot teach the majority white students. So even though my degree says I'm certified to teach, even though my master's degree that I earned with honor says that I'm highly qualified to teach all students where I live in this county, it says, no, 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 no. You can teach here, but not here. You can be a leader here at these schools because it has a high percentage of black people here but I can't send you out to this white area. No, that because that, that would cause a problem. And, and what if those parents protested and said, I don't want the black teacher. I don't want the black assistant principal in my school. Oh no, uh, uh, the county office would have to be a part and take a stand on racism. And we can't do that because racism doesn't exist, right? It's the, the quiet, silent things that we do and say that instill and promote racism without ever saying it. They don't say they don't want black teachers. You just don't hire them. When you have black student teachers come into your school and they don't see black administrators, they don't see black leaders, black teachers, they don't feel welcome. They don't feel like they're a part of something in that school. And so I had a human resources person tell me, well, they don't stay. Well, why should they stay? You haven't opened the door to make them feel welcome. They see no one like themselves. So one, I have to fight the battle of being a first year teacher. And then two, I have to be the only black person in the building. Who's going to stand up for me when that that parent comes in my room and talks down to me. Who's going to stand up for me when that parent says, I don't want this teacher. And they said to you as an administrator, a white administrator, I don't want this black teacher. What do you say? You move that child to another room because we don't want to deal with that type of racism because it doesn't exist. Those are the small hidden things that we deal with all the time that just go unsaid. Nobody says a thing. I have teacher friends that, oh, I don't shop at that mall because it's too many black people. You don't like that. You feel threatened. You feel like it's ghetto because there are black people there now. Oh, my children can't go to that school because it has a high percentage of black students. That's why. Oh, I'll go to the football games, yes, because it's just white enough that it's okay. Oh, I don't go to the football games. Oh, I don't go to the basketball games, excuse me. Oh no, I don't go to the basketball games because it's a gym full of black people and you don't associate with that many black people. Oh, you work with us and that's fine. Oh, Paula has a nice family. She's such a nice lady and she's so sweet. And it's okay, we work together. But you don't want my kind living in your neighborhood. You don't want me to buy the land that's for sale up the street from your home. If you see black people walking on that property, you're looking, you're wondering, you're, who's that, who are those people? Those are the things that go unsaid. We don't talk about that. We, it doesn't exist. Good Christian teachers in this county do and say things in front of people or to your children and it's passed on. Oh, you can date him. Uh, uh, sorry, you can be friends with him, but you can't date him. 
Yeah, my son was was dating a young a young lady, young a young white woman, and he walked from the racetrack all the way back to the high school because her parents pulled up in their car and she was scared. And she told my son, he carries a gun. He carries a gun. My dad carries a gun. Get, get, don't come back to the car. And he walked back to the school for fear of what would happen to him because he was dating this young lady. And, and you know, she moved on and my son moved on, but it's just the idea of you can be friends with them, but you can't date them. I know a teacher that told my niece that, you know, her son and my niece were, were dating. She said, you guys can be friends. It's okay to be friends, but that's it. Because she was black. This is a good Christian woman, very sweet teacher. and But that's not racist, right? That's just a personal preference. I guess that's that's how you justify it in your home and that's how you make it okay with your children but if you are a Christian and you think that you can't date someone because of their race that's racist if you are an educator and you say openly to people my children can't go to that school my children can't can't uh, go to those games no you can't go to a basketball game I don't I don't go to the that area or um, you make comments about a student's hair when they come in your classroom and or you just don't say anything you may be that educator where I didn't know what to say then you are accepting and allowing that racism you are passing it on at the dinner table the conversations you have with your children Guys, I, I just want to say that it still exists and I have lived with it for many years and it's, it's not going to go away overnight, but it's time to talk about it. It's time to discuss those things that you don't want to say. Like right now, you should feel a little uncomfortable and that's what the conversation should be like. They should be uncomfortable. Growth is about change. It's about making things feel different. When you're exercising and weightlifting, it's a little uncomfortable if you expect growth. And that's the conversation we need to have, especially as educators, as teachers, as parents, as administrators, as county office workers. We need to be having those conversations. The things that you say at the dining room table, at the kitchen table with your families that you would never say to me but they happen all the time. It's time. It's time, guys. I'm coming from my heart and I'm sharing as a black woman. And I hope that it opens up a conversation, a dialogue, if nothing else. I'm not asking for everyone to agree. I'm not asking to, to justify how I feel because I don't, I don't need that. But I just want someone to understand what we think and the thought process we have as black people. It's very different from how you guys think and how you feel. How I raise my children is very different. The conversations that I have to have with my children going out into the world that you never thought about having with your children. The conversations I have with my husband about walking into a room and being the only black person in the room. How often does that happen? How often do you even go to a place where you're the only white person in the room? It doesn't happen. Because in your mind, that's not a safe place. I know you, you won't say that out loud. This It's not something that you talk about freely in front of people. But it's the conversations that we need to start having. I hope you guys understand where I'm coming from. I hope you understand that it's from a, a place of love. And I hope you hear me. Have a great day. Goodbye.